This episode was brought to you by Audible, the world's largest selection of high-quality audiobooks. To get your free 30-day trial, sign up on audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. This week, I recommend Theft by Finding, Diaries, written and narrated by David Sedaris. You can hear this book or 180,000 others at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. Okay, you want to get started? Yep, let's do it. Welcome back to another Thursday on the Brainwaves podcast. I'm Jim Siegler. In this week's installment of our series, Teaching Through Clinical Cases, we'll be talking about a patient who was seen in a neurology clinic for proximal weakness. Presenting the case today and explaining her approach to this particular chief complaint will be the neurologist and a former neuromuscular fellow from the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Mega Domne. Thanks so much for inviting me, Jim. Well, thank you for joining us. So, let's jump right in. Tell us about the patient you saw. So, we saw a 49 years old right handed Caucasian female with a medical history of hypertension. Uh, she was seen for evaluation of progressive muscle weakness since um, the last five to six months. So, she had a preceding flu like illness, preceding to the muscle uh, pain and the cramps, which she had in her arms and thighs. She also had some shoulder pain on the left side. This was followed a few days later by difficulty climbing stairs, getting in and out of the car, and she had to usually she had to live, literally pull herself up from a chair. She had difficulty combing her hair as well, reaching her back while showering, and also could not lift her two and a half year old granddaughter with her arms. She could drive a car, had good strength in her feet, had no problems buttoning and unbuttoning her blouse opening jars, and did not drop objects from her hands. She thinks she has lost her muscle mass over the shoulders and the thighs. Let's stop there for a second and do some lesion localizing for the listeners. Uh So what immediately jumps out to me, and what you've done a great job of illustrating, is that this is a picture of a proximal pattern of weakness. Correct. So I'll talk about this a bit, and you should chime in as well. Your patient has difficulty getting out of a car, climbing stairs, combing her hair, and so on, without any sensory disturbance. So this makes me think about disorders which preferentially affect the shoulders and the hip flexor muscle groups and the neuromuscular junction. What diagnoses would you consider in your differential? So with a limb girdle pattern of proximal muscle weakness, the possible causes that um, we would consider are either, number one, muscle disease, number two, Neuromuscular junction disorder like myasthenia gravis or LEMS, which is Lambert Eaton Myasthenic Syndrome. The third possibility would be a CIDP with chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. They can present with proximal weakness as well as distal muscle weakness. Now, here, CIDP is less likely because, as I mentioned before, uh, she did not have any sensory involvement. As far as a neuromuscular junction disorder, she did not have a history of fatigability. So that probably is less likely. So we are dealing with a case of a muscle disease or more specific, a limb girdle myopathy, which could be either hereditary or an acquired myopathy. That's a great differential. And especially considering the hereditary or genetic causes of muscle disease, this encompasses a very wide range of diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And to use kind of a simple heuristic here, when distinguishing hereditary from acquired muscle or nerve disease, I think timing plays a critical role. Uh Our patient has been experiencing progressive symptoms over five to six months, as you said. And this sounds way too fast for a genetic myopathy, right? Also, there was no family history of a muscle disease. Her mother had history of a thyroid problem, but she was not aware about any thyroid disease in herself. Right, right. Well, what other historical features could sort of clue you into this being an acquired disorder? Now, with a subacute onset, preceding flu-like illness, progressive weakness, and myalgias, we can now narrow down our differential just from the history itself to an acquired, maybe an inflammatory autoimmune myopathy, like polymyositis, necrotizing myopathy, dermatomyositis, 
or a drug induced myopathy like a statin associated myopathy so we need more history for narrowing down the etiology of this muscle disease what about other secondary causes of muscle disease something like a metabolic disturbance or an endocrine abnormality a metabolic endocrine causes of myopathy would not typically present with a preceding flu like illness or myalgias but should be considered as well so we'll still test for many of these right okay so what among these causes would you consider some common causes would be hypothyroidism hypoparathyroidism and vitamin d deficiency then the other causes of acquired muscle disease would be exposure to drugs which i mentioned before common would be statins prednisone colchicine and also toxins such as alcohol these are very common causes and they should be questioned was there anything else in the history that could help narrow this down so her sensations were intact as i mentioned previously uh she just had some difficulties swallowing dry foods some dysphagia but um, she did not have any other cranial nerve associated symptoms no change in her vision or double vision or droopy eyelids let me interrupt you here for a second because these historical elements are important just to mention briefly dysphagia in the absence of diplopia is somewhat reassuring to exclude neuromuscular junction disorders and cranial neuropathies but dysphagia in itself is not a very specific symptom for many conditions because you can see it with structural lesions involving the esophagus like an oropharyngeal cancer or a lymphoma uh-huh. an infectious or inflammatory lesion like candidiasis and you can also see it in problems with motility like the neuromuscular problems that we're concerned about in this particular patient correct importantly dysphagia is important to recognize because it can correlate with respiratory impairment correct correct yeah and patients may not even endorse a history of shortness of breath but they still have an evolving hypercapnia they may have sleep apnea or a compensated chronic respiratory acidosis so my next two questions are did your patient complain of any dyspnea and were there any other triggers for her proximal and bulbar symptoms so she denied any history of shortness of breath there was no history of exposure to medications especially statins and she was on hydrochlorothiazide vitamin d3 uh b6 and b12 she did not have weight loss she did not have any constitutional symptoms like fever or decreased appetite she did not drink alcohol she never smoked as well okay so no clear triggers now you briefly mentioned that this all began following an infectious prodrome which i always think is kind of hard to recognize as being relevant or not mhm i mean if you ask any patient who comes to see you if they've felt sick or feverish in the last year I bet everyone will say they came down with something at some point. But maybe there was something specific about her preceding illness that could be a clue. More on that in a minute when our show continues. Hi, my name is Twitchy Smirstick. Support for this episode and the following message come from Audible, home to nearly 200,000 audiobooks. I recommend Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. If you hadn't heard of it, then I feel bad for you. This book or any other can be yours for free for 30 days if you sign up on audibletrial.com/brainways. That's audibletrial.com/brainways. Thank you. So we left off on what if anything about her preceding illness several months ago might give you a hint about her developing condition. So, Dr. Domney, any other information you could give us about that? She had a uh, an itchy and a reddish skin rash over her knuckles, knees and elbows, both thighs, anterior chest, abdomen and lower back. And this was still persistent. And there was no history of a similar rash or weakness or joint pains in the past. So that's interesting. Let's move on to the exam and I want to see what you think about this rash. Sure. So she was a well-appearing, comfortable lady, no cute stress. Now her examination was remarkable for a purplish colored rash over the knuckles bilaterally and over the extensor aspects of the elbows, knees, anterior aspect of the chest, neck and abdomen. Uh lower back and the medial and the outer aspect of both the thighs. Nails were unremarkable however with no pitting or any periungual um telangiectasia or erythema. I definitely don't consider myself an expert in the nail examination. So tell me what you're looking for and why it's important that this patient didn't have any of those findings you specified. 
because here we are suspecting an autoimmune inflammatory myopathy of a differential in the setting of a skin rash and proximal muscle weakness. So we are looking for features consistent with either dermatomyositis or overlap myositis, where myositis uh, is associated with connective tissue disorders like lupus or systemic sclerosis, where you would have skin and nail findings. Uh, so nail changes, like pitting on the nails, are something like shallow or deep holes on the nails, and they look like white spots. They're seen commonly in psoriatic arthritis, connective tissue disorders, and autoimmune disorders. The other nail changes which have been described in um, inflammatory myopathies or dermatomyositis and connective tissue diseases um, associated with inflammatory myopathies would be uh, nail fold telangiectasias, which are dilated capillary loops at the base of the fingernails. Sometimes you would see longitudinal ridging or periungual erythema, which could be seen in patients with lupus. Interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that about the nail findings, but the skin rash that you described is the nail in the coffin. It's pretty specific for dermatomyositis, right? Yes. Uh, the, this rash, you know, may, they can precede the muscle weakness or they may accompany the muscle weakness. In our patient, actually, it preceded the muscle weakness almost six to eight months or even a year before she had the muscle weakness. And these are very classical skin rashes. So the heliotrope uh, rash with edema, which is the periorbital rash, the V sign, which is the erythematous rash seen on the neck and the anterior chest. There's also a shawl sign described, which is the erythematous rash on the back and the shoulders. Gautrin's papules, which are violaceous eruptions on the knuckles. Gautrin's sign, which is the violaceous eruptions on the extensor aspects of other joints. And um, these are photosensitive, they could be itchy or painful, and they may even bleed. So the Gautrin's papules and the heliotrope rash are pathognomonic for dermatomyositis. Great, great. So we pretty much have our diagnosis, and I'm guessing her exam is consistent with her history, largely proximal muscle weakness, without any sensory involvement, and normal reflexes, correct? Correct. So let's just go straight to some of the serologic tests. What would you send for this kind of patient? We did muscle enzymes to begin with. The CK was 85, it's normal, and the aldolase was normal as well, 6.9. Interesting, considering dermatomyositis is now number one, number two, and number three on my differential diagnosis. Are those numbers what you expected? That's not unusual. So 70 to 80% of patients with dermatomyositis, roughly, about they should have an elevation in CK even up to 50-fold high. But 20% of dermatomyositis patients, a small number, would can have normal CK levels. Rarely, they may have just isolated elevation of aldolase levels. The other labs that, um, that was abnormal um, was the uh, ANA with a titer of 1 as to 160. Her TSH was normal. Um, vitamin D3 level was unremarkable. And the ANCA was negative. How do you interpret these findings, Dr. Domney? Yeah, so the positive ANA could be nonspecific, but it may reflect that this is probably a, an autoimmune disease, uh, autoimmune myopathy in the setting of the clinical scenario, basically, that we had with this patient. So next, I'm assuming you'll send off some sort of autoimmune myositis panel. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So when we test, uh, when we send the myositis panel, it tests for the different antibodies which cause the inflammatory myopathies, which would be, um, when we talk about inflammatory myopathies, we're talking about dermatomyositis, polymyositis, antisynthetase syndrome, which is a combination of myositis, severe interstitial lung disease, arthritis, and Raynaud's phenomenon. So that's one group. The other group would be necrotizing myositis and overlap myositis. So the antibodies which are tested... At this point in our conversation, Dr. Domney segues into antibodies associated with the inflammatory myopathies. For the sake of time here, I'm going to jump in and try to summarize this part. But if you want, you can hear Dr. Domney talk all about the different antibodies associated with inflammatory myopathies in our episode last week. There's a table we've included in the blog which also summarizes some of this information. But to briefly review it for the listeners who only plan to listen to this episode, here's my summary. Here's my summary. 
In general, we find positive antibodies in patients with inflammatory myopathies only about 60% of the time, so many cases must be diagnosed with muscle tissue. In dermatomyositis specifically, the antibodies we see include anti-MI2, which we see in classic dermatomyositis, anti-MDA2, which is the antibody for amyopathic dermatomyositis, and it's associated with a rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. And finally, anti-TIF1 and anti-NXP2, which are seen in cancer-associated dermatomyositis. Anti-JO1 antibodies, which are the most commonly encountered antibodies in inflammatory myopathies, are seen in the antisynthetase syndrome and polymyositis. And antisynthetase syndrome is a condition where patients have proximal myopathy in addition to other clinical features like Raynaud's phenomenon, fever, they get mechanics hands, and interstitial lung disease. There are other important antibodies to recognize, but you should check these out on the blog or on the prior episode. But getting back to our patient, as it turns out, the myositis panel was negative. So the muscle biopsy was done. And it showed very classical changes, um, which is perifascicular atrophy, consistent with um, dermatomyositis and um, inflammation as well. I guess that's not surprising given the history and exam findings, which all point to a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. And as we covered in detail in that previous episode, a negative test shouldn't keep you from pursuing the biopsy in the remainder of the workup. Yeah. Especially with the high risk of interstitial lung disease and malignancy associated with these inflammatory conditions, right? That's a good question because cancer can be diagnosed either simultaneously with the onset of myositis or before or even years after the diagnosis of inflammatory myopathy. So the risk of cancer is greater in patients with dermatomyositis than those with polymyositis. And studies have shown that, um, you know, there's efficacy in screening for the cancer for five years after the onset of dermatomyositis as well. So I would, scre- I would say that I would, see, I would screen these patients for malignancy up to three to five years after the onset of the disease. And the most common malignancies would be adenocarcinoma of the cervix, ovary, breast, colon, melanoma. So basically, you need a thorough skin exam and maybe a whole body PET CT or a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to look for an underlying cancer. Right. Uh, Abdomen and pelvis, right. And as I mentioned before, like cancer-associated myositis, I mean, there's a very high risk with the newer antibodies, which is anti-TIF1 gamma and the NXP2. So TIF1 gamma actually is very highly associated with malignancy. It's up to about even 50 to 75 percent of um, patients have a malignancy. And for our patient, her testing was negative? Correct. Okay, well, that's good. But that said, there's still a small but real risk that she could develop cancer later. So I'm assuming she'll continue to be followed with periodic imaging. Yeah. How else did you treat her for dermatomyositis? So we treated our patient with prednisone. We started her on um, 60 milligrams uh, per day, which is like one milligram per kilo per day. And we kept that dose for about six to eight weeks. And we saw her as a follow-up. After about six to eight weeks, see, she still, she improved a little bit. There was a significant difference that she was able to climb stairs and she could get in and out of her car and she could lift her hands up a little bit better. So she did respond to the steroids a little bit, uh, but not completely. uh, She did not respond completely to the steroids. And at that time, we decided to um, treat her with IVIG. In addition to the steroids, so we now plan to taper her steroids now if there's a response to IVIG. If she doesn't continue to respond to the prednisone or the IVIG, what other treatments could you offer her? So the alternative therapies uh, would be the steroid sparing agents, methotrexate, isothioprine, and mycophenolate morphotil. Uh, now IVIG is used for patients who have resistance to steroid. And um, the other therapies would be, uh, I think, rituximab which is a monoclonal antibody against CD20. It was studied in a RIM trial, which is the rituximab and myositis trial. And then the other medications, um, cyclophosphamide, calcineurin inhibitors like tacromlimus, cyclosporin, have been studied in small case series. TNF-alpha inhibitors have been studied um, in small case reports have been published based on those case series, yeah. Excellent. So many options to choose from. 
Right, right, right. What should our listeners take away from this case? So, I mean, this patient presents with a very classical presentation of dermatomyositis with a limb girdle distribution of muscle weakness and the classical rash. Of course, it, we did learn about the, the importance of muscle biopsy, the classical muscle findings with perifascicular atrophy. And uh, the presence of autoantibodies, you know, they are now being increasingly used with increasing frequency to predict the manifestations of these various inflammatory myopathies, which would be interstitial lung disease and possibility of cancer besides the typical muscle weakness. So it's very important to recognize the clinical syndrome. Now, we may not have a positive antibody. I mean, they are not done routinely, especially the newer antibodies. So I think within the coming years, I think more and more people would be aware about these antibodies and we would probably order it in, in most of our patients. Uh, We may uh, be talking about more of targeted therapies um, based on the pathogenesis of the disease. And that probably will help lowering the high mortality associated with inflammatory uh, myopathies. Great. So we have a lot more to look forward to in the coming years. Thanks so much for being a part of our program today, Dr. Domney. I really appreciate your time. It It was great talking with you. Again, that was Dr. Mega Domne from the Cleveland Clinic. For more information about considerations in a patient with proximal weakness, check out the blog at brainwaves.me. You can also sign up for the weekly emails there that summarize all the new content that we post online with these episodes. We've got links to some great resources, as well as ways to buy high-yield books and other materials there if you're interested. Brainwaves is supported in part by Audible, your source for audiobooks. To get your free 30-day trial and first free audiobook, Check out audibletrial.com slash brainwaves and sign up. This episode was produced by me, Jim Siegler. Music by Chris Zabriskie, The New Valleys, and Heisen. Stay tuned for the upcoming episode next week for some information you might not have known about syncope and why so many Marines pass out during their graduation ceremonies. That's all for Brainwaves this week. I'm Jim Siegler. Thanks for tuning in.